Today we're going to talk about one-sided limits. My name is Tuesday J. Johnson. I'm a lecturer at University of Texas El Paso and an associate professor at Doña Ana Community College. This corresponds to Math 1411 at UTEP, Calculus. Chapter 1, Limits and Their Properties from Larson's 11th edition of Calculus. I'm going to break this up into three parts. So one-sided limits is going to be part one of this section. So what is a one-sided limit? Frequently a function will have different behavior to the left and right of the value C under question. When this happens, we take a look at one-sided limits. And through this we can find asymptotes, we can find t different types of discontinuities. Now in order to talk about one-sided limits, I need to go back to a very basic concept. Consider a number line with negatives to the left and positives to the right, right? That's what we have, zero, we have positives to the right, we have negatives to the left. We're gonna use this idea in our notation. So that number line helps us define our one-sided limits as follows. From the right, we use a little X, uh, superscript, right? As X approaches C and then a superscript of plus means from the right, because on a number line, the positive numbers are on the right of f of x equals l, and from the left we'll use a little superscript of a negative, saying from the left, from the negative side of the number line. From the right is positive, and from the left is negative. All right, let's take a look at some examples. Oh, first we need to know when a limit exists, my bad. Let f be a function, and let c and l be real numbers. The limit of f of x as x approaches c is, the, is l if and only if the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x equals l and the limit as x approaches c from the right of f of x equals l. What does this mean? It means that the limit exists overall if and only if the limits from each side exist and are equal to each other. So we know a limit exists because the limit from the left is equal to the limit from the right. We kind of had a basic idea of this in section 1.2 when we were looking at graphically and numerically, but now it's solidified for us with uh, actual math detail. So what does this mean graphically? Here in blue, just some function with an open circle, as x approaches c from the left, so here's c, from the left side, I get closer and closer to C with my X values. We can see that the Y values get closer and closer to 2. Now, as I approach C from the right side, all right, so I'm coming closer and closer to C from the right, I see that the graph itself gets closer and closer to a Y value of negative 3. All I'm doing to find a limit graphically, one-sided or otherwise, is I'm tracing the graph and determining what y value it's hitting as my x values get closer and closer to c. Now, we can see that the limit from the left, 2, and the limit from the right, negative 3, are not equal. This tells us that the limit does not exist as x approaches c for this particular graph. How do we find the limits? Well, finding the limit as x approaches 2 from the right is very similar to finding limit as x approaches 2, only we take care in certain situations. Let's take a look. If I try to put 2 in, because I always try to evaluate first, I'll end up with 0 over 0. That tells me I have to do something. That something I choose to do is factor, difference of squares in the denominator. I factored a negative 1 in the numerator, so I could switch the order of my subtraction. The x minus 2's cancel. And I have a new function, negative 1 over x plus 2, that is the same as the original function everywhere except at my c value of 2. Now from the right, from the left, it doesn't matter. As x approaches 2 from the right, negative 1 over x plus 2 becomes negative 1 over 4 because we can evaluate that. The fact that it was coming from the right didn't make any difference in this particular example. As x approaches 10 from the left of the absolute value of x minus 10 over x minus 10. Now notice that the numerator and denominator are exactly the same, except the numerator will never be negative, the denominator might be. As x approaches 10 from the left, so values left of 10 are smaller than 10, so something like 9. 9 minus 10 is a negative 1, but in absolute value that will become a positive 1 in the numerator. 
9 minus 10 is a negative 1 in the denominator. Positive 1 over negative 1 gives us a negative 1. And I could do this numerically. I could check 9.99999, something that's very close and to the left of 10. But I'm going to end up with the same numerical value. The numerator will always be positive in this case, close to 10. And the denominator for values left of 10 or it will always be negative. And so our result is the limit is negative 1. Cotangent. It's helpful if you know the graph of cotangent. So if you have that memorized, many other trig graphs and other uh, algebraic graphs memorized, limits become much easier. You could visualize them. But if you don't have it memorized, that's okay. Remember that cotangent is cosine over sine. And as x approaches pi, well, sine of pi is zero. And a number other than zero divided by zero that does not exist. DNE does not exist. So we can't divide by zero. The limit doesn't exist. But what's going on from the right and from the left as we approach pi? Here we have pi. And as we approach pi from the left side on the graph of cotangent, the y values go to negative infinity. As we approach pi from the right side on x, the y values go to positive infinity. So we could see from the limit from the right is going to positive infinity, whereas the limit from the next uh, from the left is negative infinity, and uh, that gives us some asymptotes in this case. All right, that greatest integer function. The limit as x approaches four from the right of five, the greatest integer of x minus seven. I try to evaluate. Right, I just substitute it. Put 4 in for x. I know the greatest integer of 4 is 4 itself. 5 times 4 is 20. Minus 7 is 13. But let's see. For values close to 4, but to the right. So on the right of 4, as I get closer and closer to the value of 4 on x, my y value is going to be 4. Notice, if I try to evaluate the limit as x gets close to 4 from the left, those y values would be 3. And so from the right and from the left, you could have different values. A piecewise defined function. Find the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of f of x, where f of x is defined by x plus 2 over 2 when x is less than or equal to 3, and 12 minus 2x over 3 when x is bigger than 3. Now this is asking for the limit to the left of 3. Left of 3, I'm going to use the top piece. I only consider the top piece because I don't care what's happening at 3. I care what's happening to the left of 3 and left of less than go together. So I evaluate the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of x plus 2 over 2, which is 3 plus 2 over 2, which gives me 5 halves. Sometimes for step functions, the limit from the left and the limit from the right are different. Sometimes for asymptotes, the limit from the left and the limit from the right are different. Sometimes with piecewise defined functions, the limit from the left and the limit from the right are different. But that doesn't mean it's any different to evaluate these limits. You just have to pay a little bit more attention to what side and what the values are going to look like.